Let's pray for Elder Jehu as he delivers today's word. Father, we pray. We thank you, Lord. There's no other person named in our congregation as Yehu. So, Father, Lord, let him will your word, will your sword, and bring forth a sharp word. A sharp word to define where CMC stands on this subject matter of nationhood and of a royal priesthood. Let us all be a royal priesthood unto you, Lord, for you have called us, you handpicked us, Lord. So, Father, let him speak with the words of wisdom and prophecy. And, Lord, I received these words, these three letters this morning as we were praying. W O W. He will deliver a wow word for today. And that wow word is not to wow us, but it is words of wisdom. Words of a watchman on the wall. So let him bring forth your rich word. Powerful word, strong word, defining word, a separating word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Yesterday we had a Shabbat service, as usual, and we had Elder Suman who came. Earlier on, Elder Suman was supposed to preach a week before, but she was recovering from COVID, but the Lord has designed her to speak yesterday. And yesterday was the night of off. And night of off, many things happened. The two temples were destroyed. The two world wars were started. The Jewish people were evicted from UK. At the same time, the Spanish Inquisition also, the Jewish people was evicted on the same day. But yesterday was a great day because she did prophetic declaration to reverse back the iniquities and the curses on the land of Israel and also on our land of Singapore. I believe this morning, I'm greatly privileged. And I also believe that this is ordained by the Spirit of God. And as Sister Flo shared, I had goosebumps. At two Sundays, we had the story of Elijah. And the proclamation was, Elijah anointed Hazel, king of Syria, anointed Jehu, the king of Israel, and then anointed the next generation. So come with me and let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. You are in control. You are the God that created all of us. Let this word be so convicting by the Spirit of God that will move and hover around us that we will rise up to raise up the next generation who knows you and who will do great exploit for you. In the mighty name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. This morning, it is going to preach on Romans 1, 18 to 32, and also particularly subtitled Section 377A, which is the hot topic today and has been debated in the parliament the last week and the ensuing period. So I feel that God is really wanted every one of us to rise up. And today, because it is National Day, I'm so thankful to see so many of you here wearing red and white. And I sense a change of atmosphere with the banner praising the Lord and this wonderful declaration. Yahweh is God. Shall we all rise and we as Singaporean declare our national pledged? As we speak together, declare it together with me. We, the citizens of Singapore, pledge ourselves as one united people, regardless of race, language or religion, to build a democratic society based on justice and equality so as to achieve happiness, prosperity and progress for our nation. Please be seated. And amen. This is such a wonderful pledge that was worded by our founding leaders 
and let's remember our nation today. So this morning, let me give you an outline of what I'm going to share. It will be a little bit long so that I would ask for your indulgence. And I believe that this is an important message for a time such as this. The sermon outline is in three major categories. I want to lay down the scripture foundation, the basis of what we're going to share. Next, I'm going to move on to the moral compass of this nation, as declared by our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in 2005. And then we're going to end up with a stirring call of what we each ought to do. And I pray that the Lord will give us the spirit of Issachar to know and to discern the time and the season that what we individually and as a family and as a nation, what we ought to do. Scriptural foundation, there's only one reason I would say that why Singapore prosper. Singapore prosper not because of our geographical location, not because of so clever people around. But I believe in Scripture, it says in Proverbs 14.34 that righteousness exhort the nation. And it's because of righteousness of our founding ministers that this nation prosper. And I also declare that Myanmar will have leaders that stand up of righteousness and Myanmar, Myanmar will be for the Lord. So, on the contrary, since it's a reproach to all, and henceforth, if you look at righteousness, Yeshua is the righteousness of God. And the word came to say that He fulfilled all righteousness. So when you talk about righteousness, you look at Scripture, there's so many references to what we do is right. And righteousness is so important for us to remember that we serve a God of righteousness and henceforth, we ourselves ought to be right with a holy God, right with our fellow neighbours, our friends, our family and our nation. Our founding Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, said this, I am very determined if I decide what something is worth doing. Then I put my heart and soul to it. The whole ground can be against me. Yes, right now, the whole ground seems to be against all of us who stand for righteousness. But the whole ground can be against me, but if I know it is right, I will do it. That's the business of a leader. And I want to surmise to you that it's also the business of us as the sons and daughters of the mighty God. Amen. That we do what is right. Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew may not be a believer, and I trust that he accepted the Lord before he passes off. But he is a man of righteousness. Righteousness exhort a nation. He did not say Christian exhort a nation. But he says very clearly in Proverbs 14 that righteousness exhort a nation. So I proclaim and I decree that all of us will rise up to be right with first of all the Holy God and be right with one another and to serve one another in love. So let's go to Scripture. What do we know what is right in Romans 1, 18-32? It says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And then what happened? Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto them. So this is the word of God, which is again, I want to repeat this verse 18 one more time. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We see that in display. A God is a God of justice. A God is a holy God. A God of righteousness. An unrighteous man is the one who suppresses truth in unrighteousness. And in Thess 2 Thessalonians 2.10, it says, the unrighteous were perished. So hear me. The unrighteous will perished. 
because they did not receive the love of truth. And the truth is a person. They did not receive Yeshua as their personal Savior. That's why the unrighteous will perish. And you want to find out what is the wrath of God? Go and study the book of Revelation, particularly chapter 15 to 16, where it is the last seven bowl of wrath of God has been poured out. And Scripture says, because God has shortened the time, or else no flesh can survive. We have yet seen such things at all, but I believe we are coming very close to that time. The Miamis have experienced a glimpse of it now. The Ukrainians have experienced a glimpse of it now, but it's only a glimpse. The worst has not yet been seen. But I tell you the good news. <laughs> With all this gloom and doom. The good news is that it will be short and those who keep God's commandment and persevere will be kept from the hour of trial. And that is in the book of Revelation 3.10. So I want to encourage you, despite all this gloom and doom, we are the conqueror. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. And we will not go through the wrath of God, but I believe the church will go through the wrath of the dragon. And it is the great tribulation, which is the wrath of the dragon, will come and purify the church. When persecution comes, the church becomes purified. The church becomes revived. So I want to ask all of us, prepare for persecution to come. But when persecution comes, persevere and do not give up your faith. God has shown His invisible attributes and there is no excuse of us not knowing the truth. For the psalmist say, the heaven declares the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. So here, the Word of God is so clear that we have no excuse not to believe a God that created every one of us and created the entire universe. We have no excuse not to know Him. So I just want to have a short summary because I know today's word is heavy. And in summary, it says in Romans 1.18, unrighteous people are those who choose not to know the truth. And the truth is a person. The truth is Yeshua. And verse 19 says, God's anger is on them who wittingly, unwittingly do not believe Him despite He has shown His magnificent creation. He has created you and I in His image and in His likeness. So here in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality, His external power and divine nature, having been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made so that people without excuse. So there is no excuse. When judgment day comes, the bema seat of the Lord comes, all our sins will be exposed. And if you're not covered by the blood of the Lamb, the only way you go is to the lake of fire. So I just want to pray that all of us understand this. And let us not play church. Let us be right with a God that is holy. Let us know Him by reading His Word. And there's still time. Time of repentance. Time of making right with the holy God. And Romans verse 21 say, For even though they knew God, they did not honour Him as God, or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here, verse 21 says, Know God, but did not give Him the glory. And this I also emphasize in Jeremiah which says, what justice have your father found in me? 
that they have gone far from me, have followed idols and have become idolaters. So here, scriptures very plainly tell us both the Old Testament and the New Testament of what is to come. So if you do not know the Bible well, we will be like the blind, leading the blind. So as leaders, we need to know the Word of God. As congregation members, you need to know the Word of God so that you can discern between half-truth and the real truth that will set you free. Moving on to 22 to 23, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, don't we see all this happening around us? Even ministers of God, they are not any exception because they do not know the truth. They do not have a close and intimate relationship with God and they are leading their sheep to the slaughter and change the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corrupt, to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So again, we have fallen and we have worshipped the idols that are made by hand. Deuteronomy says it very clear, clearly in the mountain of Horeb, which is the mountain where Moses met with God. And that's where Elijah went to. There, in the midst of the fire that appeared to Moses, they began to worship the calf image and they also worshipped the creation of God, the sun and the moon. But they did not worship the God of creation. So this is a very timely reminder that our allegiance is to a holy God. Even despite the fact that He has created such magnificent things for us to enjoy, that's a blessing for us. But we cannot forget the Creator God, that He will own His allegiance, not to men, no matter how anointed the person is, not to women, no matter how much He has or she has given to you in terms of blessing you. But the blessing comes from our Father in heaven. So here, moving to 24 to 25, Therefore God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So here, again, a summary of all these verses 21 to 25. They did not glorify God because they do not acknowledge Him. They worship instead images made by hand and also the creation of what God has done, the sun and the moon. And the warning is that because of that stiff neck, that unbelief, God gave them up. So for this cause, in 26 to 27, God gave them up into vile affection, for even women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And we call it love. So persuasive. Love. And likewise also men leaving the natural use of the women. So here, in Romans 28-29, basically says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a repopulate mind to do those things that are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornications, wickedness, covetousness, malicious, the debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, now, these are all the things that we are beginning to see around us. And it acts as a warning for all of us. So beware of the sin against your own body. Flee from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside his body. 
but he who commits sexual immorality sin against his own body. 1 Corinthians 6.18 is a reminder. And Leviticus very clearly defines what is a natural relationship. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It's an abomination. So man's sex with man is an abomination. Now I can boldly declare it today in the pulpit, but in many Western nations, when you start to preach this way, you are deemed to have hate speech and you can go to prison. So not on our watch that we will continue to be able to preach boldly from the pulpit what the Bible says. And so, Romans 1, 30-31, they are biters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, bolster, inventor of even things. Again, this is something we are seeing now. Disobedient to parents, have you seen that? Disrespectful, dishonoring parents, without understanding covenant breakers with natural affection, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. So I'd like to summarize again these couple of verses. If we let sin simmer in us, it will take root and it will grow shoot and the fruits will be evil. So let not sin remain in us. We need to repent and ask for forgiveness. Engage in unnatural sexual activities. Men lust after men. Women lust after women. And God gave them as a result a reprobate mind. So what does a reprobate mind mean? When a sinner is so hardened as to feel no remorse or misgiving of conscience for a particular evil act, that is a reprobate mind. Your senses of right and wrong is so hardened that when you see wrong, you just say, well, it's normal. It's the norm now. And that's what God say. if you do not come back to Him, a day will come, He will give you what is due to you, a reprobate mind, that you are not able to differentiate from your conscience that is given to you between what right and wrong is. So the key verse here, I want to emphasize, is the last verse. Though they are fully aware of God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve to die. We heard it in all the various verses. But here, listen to this. They not only do themselves, but approve and applaud others who practice them. That means that those who approve, despite not engaging in the act, is likewise guilty of the act. Romans 1 32. And the righteous judgment of God will come. So here we need to understand that by keeping silent is no an option. When we see things that are wrong and we tend to keep quiet, you are party to that sin. So here I want to move quickly to the second part of what I want to share. It's the moral compass. What we need to know, what is Section 377A? And let me just talk, mention that again. Section 377A is a penal code, which is the law of a land. It basically says, any man who in public or private commits or abets the commission or procures or attempt to procure the commission by any male person of any act of gross indecency with another male. That means if you do the act sexually, men with men, all right, shall be punished with imprisonment for a term that may extend to two years. Now, this is our current penal code, section 377A, which the opposition are trying to remove it from our law. I want to take you through time to the year 2007, particularly on 23rd of October. In Parliament, our Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Hsien Loong, said this. 
that Singapore is basically a conservative society. And he actually checked with the AG, the Attorney General. And the Attorney General advised to the government is the continual retention of Section 377A would not be a contravention of our Constitution. Now, to put it in a nutshell, it basically say the existing law, Section 377A, does not contradict our Constitution of the state. We have to remember that. And then he further says, it has been so and by policy, we have reinforced this. And we want to keep it so. And this is what he says. Reinforcing Section 377A by defining family in Singapore, we mean one man, one woman marrying, having children, bringing up children within that framework of a stable family unit. That is what he meant by reinforcing Section 377A, by defining that the marriage and the family comprises of one man and one woman and not two men or two women, which the LGBTQ community tried to change it to. Then he says, I acknowledge that not everyone fits into this mold, some are single, some have more colourful lifestyles, and some are gay. But a heterosexual, stable family is a social norm. I thank God for Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. But that was in 2007. And so far, we have gone through to 15 years, and time has marches on. And now we need to pick up the pieces and be aware of what is happening between 2007 to 2022. And he further say this is a moral marker. 377A, according to Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in 2007, is a moral marker. So what is a moral marker? It's a marker that tells you between what is right and wrong. Let me read to you. Nor do we consider homosexuality a minority. That means we don't consider them as a minority. In a sense, we consider, say, Malay and Indians as minority with minority rights protected under the law. You see, the opposition party, is, the LGBT gay community is saying that it is a minority right. But he says, because of minority rights protected under the law, languages taught in school, cultures celebrated <coughs> excuse me, by all races, <coughs> representation <coughs> guaranteed by parliament through GRC and so on. So those are the minority rights, excuse me. And then he further on says, so we should strive to maintain a balance to uphold a stable society, and these are words of wisdom, to maintain the balance and uphold a stable society with traditional heterosexual family values. But with space, he recognizes it, with space for homosexuals to live their lives and to contribute to the society. And we acknowledge that our Homosexual friends are creative and they do contribute to the well-being of a country. So that's what our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong says. Give them space without harassment so that they can contribute. But they are restrained and we do not approve them. Actively promoting their lifestyles to others or setting the tone for mainstream society. Now, let me repeat this. This is so important. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in 2007 says, we do not approve of them actively promoting their lifestyles to others or setting the tone for mainstream society. But we are beginning to see them encroaching onto this with a lot of force. And even Nancy Pelosi is coming to fight for them. And no foreign power can detect our internal domestic issues. 
Amen? Thank you for that. And the government does not act as a moral policeman. Now, that is something I don't agree, but that's what he said. And because of what he said, that the government is not a moral policeman and don't proactively enforce Section 377A on them. Because he says the government is not a moral judgment or a policeman, henceforth, we do not proactively enforce Section 377A, which is what we have today. The act is there, but the government do not actively enforce this section. Then something he said which is really very hurting. Unfortunately, the Chinese community are not as strongly engaged either for removing Section 377A or against removing 377A. So either it's for or against our Chinese community. That's basically what he says. Our Chinese community, our member of parliament that represents the Chinese, they do not do this or that. They are lukewarm, sitting on the fence. Do not against and do not for. Their attitude is live and let live. Didn't we hear that many times? And that's what section Romans 1.32 says. You can no longer live and let live where there are gross injustice and unrighteousness. In this debate, these two days, you will have noticed that there are there have been very few speeches made in Parliament in Mandarin on this subject. I don't want to quote you the names of the member of Parliament that spoke. You can search it out. For so the majority of Singaporeans, the attitude is a pragmatic one. We live and let live. While we may be pragmatic, but the forces of evil is pushing ahead. Pushing ahead, encroaching into our space. So I want to encourage you, go and read the entire speech he made in Parliament. It's available, you Google it. Lee Hsien Loong, 2007, on Section 377A, and you can read it in its full discourse. And here I'm very thankful to our Muslim community. You know, the Muslim community recently, just a few days ago, wrote in the media statement that they are against the repeal of Section 377A because it's the moral right to do so. Now, our Muslim community is vocal, they stand up. But my question is, where is the Christian community? Where is our national Christian uh, NCCS? Where is Love Singapore's public stand? But the Muslim community put their moral values into writing and their stand very clear to our government. So we can no longer leave it alone. We got to rise up to make us stand. So PM Lee's wisdom and his argument continues. Abolishing Section 377A where we do this is not going to end the argument in Singapore. Yeah, he said that. Even though you have repeal of Section 377A, it will not stay there. The argument is still continue. And among the conservative Singaporeans, the deep concern over the moral values of society will remain. And among the gay rights activists, abolition isn't going to give them what they want because what they want is not just to be free from Section 377A. Listen to what PM says. But more space and full acceptance by other Singaporeans. And they say it so. So let us not be blinded. There will, even when, if Section 377A is repealed, they will not stop at that. They will ask for more privileges and more rights and more acceptance and change the moral fiber of our nation. And that is a severe issue that we are faced with today. So supposedly we move on, 377A. I think the gay activists will push for more following the examples of other avant-garde countries in Europe and America 
to change what is taught in the schools, listen to that, to advocate same-sex marriages and parenting, to ask for exactly the same right as a straight man or a woman. This is the word of our Prime Minister in 2007. And I want to pray that all of us understand the situation then in 2007 and the situation now in 2020. Things have changed. 2022, sorry. And things have changed. Right? Thank you for that. <laughs> so, Prime Minister Lee's concluding remark is there are dangers ahead. Therefore, we decide to keep the status quo, that was 2007, on Section 377A, it's better to accept the legal untidiness and the ambiguity. Now listen to this. If it works, don't disturb it. Amen? I don't think it is wise to try to force the issue. I should therefore say that as a matter of reality, that the more gay activists push this agenda, the stronger will be the pushback from conservative forces in our society as we be, are beginning to see already in this debate and over the last few weeks and months. So the issue here is, that was 2007. My question is, in 2022, are we, the conservative part of our society, going to push back actively or we become bought up? And if we become bought up, live and let live, there will be grave consequences. And the result will be counterproductive. Yes, it will be. It takes up a lot of resources because it's going to lead to less space for the gay community in Singapore. So it's better to let the situation evolve gradually. Now, that is what we are seeing, the slippery slope. 2007, you leave it gradually evolving and now you find the gay activists are becoming larger and more active in the community space and we have to wake up. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong already said we can not leave things like that. If you let it evolve, gradually we will go down the slippery path. We will stay one step behind the front line of change, watch how things work out elsewhere before we make any irrevocable move. Now, this is a very important statement. So when we go and see a member of parliament, you say, look at what's happening in the West. Look at the unloneliness in, in the West, the defiant nature of people against the government, against ordinariness. Do we want to follow that step? Li Sien Lung, our Prime Minister, already said, take one step behind and look what is happening, and we already know what has happened. So we cannot let it evolve gradually down the slippery slope. So here, the Court of Appeal is the highest court in our nation. PM acknowledged that Section 377A is a moral marker. We cannot afford to repeal it. It demonstrates society disapproval of what is regarded as undesirable. It safeguards public morals by enabling the enforcement and prosecution of all forms of gross indecency between men. So therefore, the repeal of Section 377A removes an important moral marker. So we need to understand the battle is ahead of us. It is really charging at us as a train that has left the station. We can remain no more silent. If we let 377A be removed, we will open up a Pandora box of issues that will be harmful to society and to your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren's children. So we need to push back aggressively because it is not what we desire, but the, uh, the enemies have done that, the activists have done that. If we remain, watch up, live and let live, Amen. So, now I want to move the third part. What we need to do. So, I've covered the 
scriptural foundation. I've covered the moral compass. And now I'm going to move on the activation part, what we each ought to do as an individual, as a family, as a nation. We need, first of all, to pray for God's wisdom. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. We do not war against flesh and blood. We are warring against the spiritual realm of iniquities. Therefore, pray. That's why pre-service prayer is a very important prayer of our church because it sets the spiritual atmosphere for the worship to be anointed, for the sermon to be preached with passion and conviction. So I want to urge all of us to come. Come and work alongside your leaders. Come and pray with us, particularly to pray for the service at the pre-service prayer. We no longer remain silent because Romans 1.32 says, if you do so, you are party to the sin. Let that be a very strong warning to us. Right to reach because the government reads it and state your stand like what the Muslim community has done. Inform your family members, friends, colleagues on the impact of the lives that what I have shared with you this morning. If this section 377A is removed, most of all, there will be inconveniences to your members of parliament because your presence is important to support them, to encourage them, particularly members of parliament that understand between what is right and what is wrong. Let your voice be heard. Members of parliaments are human. You vote in them and some are office bearers. So they want to hear from the voters. We have to be polite. They will hear us out and they understand that votes counts. If more of us go and tell them and put the question to them, how do you vote? And how you vote, I will vote in my conscience. If you do not represent the majority, do not be too surprised that you are no longer in parliament come the next election. And here, what are the issues that we face with? I want to bless this brother called Liu He Kian. He is an amazing writer. He basically lists up very clearly what the issues are. And if 377A has been removed, you will have cross-dressing. On my left, or on your right, two women, one dressed like a boy, one remains dressed as a lady. And on the other side, two men, one dressed like a woman, the other one dressed like a normal lady. So here, this is called cross-dressing. You know, a man dressed like a woman, a woman dressed like a man. How could it be so confusing? And that's why God says, if you remain stiff-necked, He will give you a reprobate mind. Not able to differentiate between right and wrong. And the recent uh, incidents in Wa Chong, that Wa Chong Institution has reprimanded a counsellor and suspended him from teaching sexually education classes. Now, why did this happen? He was just listing out statistics. He's not opining his opinion. Voice of the LGBT group that created this problem for him. The bully techniques is commonly used in the LGBT community and the friendly countries, the countries that are friendly to this cause. You can read it a lot in our presses. And then here, we are having this media encroaching on us. Netflix, many of us are glued to Netflix, the Korean dramas and all those shows. But now you are beginning to see more and more of this Netflix original that encourages this lifestyle. We are seeing it right now, not even with the repeal of Section 377A let alone if this law is taken away. And then, 
a religious leader, parent or teachers, when speak out on religious principle, will be deemed as hate speech. And in the West, you have seen them in prison. Now, this is not fairy tale. You know? This is not something that has not happened before. It has happened in other nations, and we are beginning to feel the pressure, like what this student counsellor from Hua Chung had felt. So here, what are the other issues? Conservative students get bullied by students supporting the pink dot. Pressurizing them. Malicious accusations made on conservative organisations. We have seen that. Death threats made on local conservative individuals. We have got personal testimony of that. People receiving death threats for being conservative and speaking of the truth. And most of all, the most sad thing is, confused, insecure young boys may be solicited for sex from evil men. Do you want that type of society in our life, in our nation? I want to end with this. Last Monday, Monday is the only day that my member of parliament meets the people. I'm in the constituency called Tanjong Baka GRC, which is a big GRC, <laughs> from Tanjong Baka all the way to Orchard Road. <laughs> I went to see my member of parliament, the direct one, which is Mr. Elvin out of the nation for official visit. So he was not available. That I understand. Then, I don't want to give up hope, even though it's a hard time finding the place, you know. So I went to my previous member of parliament, which is Indrani Raja, my apologies. And, wow, her place is so difficult to find on the second floor. But with persistency, I went and Search the place out and guess what happened? She's not in today. I guess it was a long day in parliament. It's an urgency for you and I to see a member of parliament because that they are now debating this issue in parliament. And if you do not make your presence felt, the member of parliament that represents you may not be encouraged to speak out. I'm telling you, the battle line has been really drawn out. The battle is encroaching. And remember Romans 1.32. So with that, I want to end with a prayer for all of you, and myself included. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this is the time that is ordained by you. I did not plan this sermon you have given me the words. And I shudder with what Sister Flo says, that my name was given by Bishop Samuel Doctorian as Yehu, the king of Israel that called down the eunuch to throw down Jezebel. And henceforth, Jezebel was eaten by the wild dogs. And I understand that the spirit of Jezebel is very prevailing in churches and in families, that it is a spirit of miscommunication. It's also a spirit of witchcraft and also a spirit of disobedience. Our allegiance is only to Yahweh, our Creator God. So Father, I thank you for this sharing from my heart. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, my desire is that your name be glorified and magnified and that Singapore will continue to be blessed by you because Singapore as a nation will always uphold righteousness. So I declare that righteousness exalts Singapore and will continue. Righteousness will prevail. Our member of parliament, our ministers in our government will understand the moral fiber of our founding Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, to stand up even against opposition of what is right. And you are the righteous God. You came 
as a son of God, Yeshua, to uphold righteousness. And we thank you for anointing all of us and our nation. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Yeshua. And everyone says, Amen. Thank you for your attention.